Okay. Okay, still, uh, people are coming. Thank you very much for coming. Um, Upsec IL is one of my favorite conferences. Uh, I'm always waiting for it uh, every year. And actually, this is my first time to give a talk here, so I'm really excited and um, hope to, be, uh, to go away. So this talk is about certain type of vulnerabilities. So, so this talk is about certain type of vulnerabilities. Uh, those, the, what we can call uh, the bleed type of vulnerabilities where uh, um, some um, chunks of memory or arbitrary pieces of memory are linked to the potential attacker. So this is a vulnerability that can be explained. A little bit about my background. Uh, so I started my uh, career path as a uh, artificial intelligence uh, developer. So I started my career path as an artificial intelligence uh, developer in a few startups in Israel and Canada, uh, gaming startups, lots of uh, gaming development. Uh, then when I came back to Israel, I joined SAP as um, a development architect. And over there at SAP, I changed my path uh, to, to start and work on uh, security, where I started as a security researcher in Germany and France, and then security architect in Israel. Uh, then uh, I was also in General Motors as a security architect, um, working on uh, connected vehicles. And then today I'm uh, the product security lead uh, at uh, Cyber. So I want to take you to England. The year is 2011. It is a New Year's Eve, and uh, where 2012 is just few minutes away. Stephen Hanson receives an update code for OpenSSL from Robin Segerman. Robin Segerman is a respected academic uh, who is an expert in communication and uh, encryption protocols. And uh, Stephen Hanson is a co-founder of OpenSSL that was founded in 1998 and is still its uh, lead developer till today. So it's almost midnight. New Year's Eve, uh, everyone is partying outside. Stephen Hanson reviews the code that he just got and submits it. And this is how it all began. So moving forward in time, about two and a half years later, Nimetha tweets this message. Nimetha is a Google security researcher. OpenSSL says zero day. Now, Omer, in his uh, previous uh, lecture that was just before me, mentioned uh, OpenSSL. OpenSSL is, uh, as most of our know, is, uh, is one of the um, main of the infrastructure of the internet. It's very, very important. We cannot have the internet without OpenSSL today. And this is the heartbeat. This is what we, um, how heartbeat became to, uh, to us uh, in 2014. And uh, by many, many experts, it is considered until today the most, um, the world's security uh, bug ever. So we're going to talk about a little, uh, a little bit about Heartbeat and to understand what it is, how it happened. So Heartbeat is, is a Heartbeat vulnerability. vulnerability. And uh, Heartbeat is a feature in OpenSSL, which we're going to just cover just now to understand what's Heartbeat in order to understand what's Heartbeat. So Heartbeat is, uh, is basically uh, a way for two servers or client and a server to try and see if the session is still alive. Sometimes it's also being called uh, keep alive or heartbeat. Uh, in this case, uh, let's go through the session, the, the process 
and see how client checks together with the server that the session is still on. So the client begins with uh, creating a message. This is just, the payload is just um, a random uh, set of characters. Then it, uh, the client encrypts it with a session key that it still has from the previous session, sends it to the server. If the server still has the same session uh, key, it can uh, decrypt the message, take out the payload, and, um, and then it creates the response using the same exact payload that it got from the client. Decrypts the, pay the payload, uh, creates the response with the same session key, sends it back to the client, the client manages to decrypt the message, and then it, the client compares the two payloads, the one they sent, the one they got back from the server, this should be the same payload. If, if you got the payload and they're all the same, everything fine, we can continue on. This um, heartbeat is configurable, it can run every second, every few minutes, it depends. So that was heartbeat. Let's see what is heartbeat. So you can see here, the client uh, tells, sends this message to the server, look, I'm sending you a payload of the word bird, which has four letters, and the server returns the bird in four letters. And then the client says, look, I'm, I'm sending you the payload hot with 500 letters. And the server returns hot with 500 letters. So the other 497 characters that you send back are just from the memory, from the server's uh, runtime memory. And this is an open cell server. Open SSL server basically accepts connection from lots of servers, lots of clients. Uh, what it has in the memory is uh, credentials, tickets, uh, cookies, keys, tokens, all those what we call secrets. This is what Open SSL server has in, in the memory. And this is how it looks like a day after the disclosure. Uh, someone checked on Yahoo uh, server, and you can immediately see that uh, you can get out all the secrets from Yahoo servers. So it's not only Yahoo, uh, it was about 70, sometimes people say 80% of the servers on the internet were exposed to Albit for uh, two and a half years. Google, Yahoo, uh, Facebook, banks, you name it. So what went wrong? Let's go back again to the hot bit, the, the feature, and let's zoom in to where the server prepares the, message, the response using the payload that he got from the client. So here we see that on the left side the client, um, the, mess the, the message after it was decrypted from the client, we see that this is very high level, of course this is just pseudo, pseudo code, we can see that we have the uh, message payload and the payload length. Why we need the payload length? Because the message or, um, has several different um, uh, parameters or fields, and the payload is, is only one of them. So uh, the server needs to know where it starts, where it, where it ends, so it can take out the, the payload from that message. The server copies it to the memory and creates those two uh, parameters uh, one is the PL, which is pointer to the beginning of the uh, payload, where it starts. And the other one is the length of the payload, which it, the, it called here payload. So you can already see that I'm using, the, by the way, the exact uh, same names that are from the original code, and I think you can already start to see that there's some kind of confusion here. The payload is actually not the payload, it's the payload length, and PL is the payload. So then the server prepares the buffer, or the place for the, in the memory, to prepare for the response. So it prepares, uh, it creates a buffer with the same length of uh, payload. And then what it does here, it copies a block of memory from the one place to the other, so we have uh, the payload from the message copied down or whatever to the where the response is prepared. So here in the, in the uh, we can see that if we send hat, 
um, we, um, the server begins by pointing to the edge and then takes three uh, places. This is the block of the word heart. It takes that, copies it to the server, to the response. And then it will decrypt it, encrypt it, and send it back to the client. What you can see here is that the payload, which is the payload length, is actually completely controlled by the client. The server doesn't check anything. There's no any sanity check on this uh, parameter, on the payload length. So if we replace the client with if the evil, that tells us that the payload length is 500 for the world heart, this is what the server accepts and sends back, how we saw before, those all uh, 500 characters from its memory. So um, the reality it was that um, the, the blocks that the server could send, the, the maximum uh, length of, of block of memory, because of the way the heartbeat feature works, is 64 kilobytes of memory. That's a lot. So let's view uh, a short video of how heartbeat uh, attack looks like. So um, I prepared a Nginx server. They give me a Camtasia, so I cannot not use all the features. It's, it's amazing too. So here I prepared an uh, Nginx server that is vulnerable to open cell, to this heartbeat open cell. I'm using the best certificate there there is, and I'm using you know TLS 1.2. So the problem is not with the certificate, and it's not with the TLS 1.2. It is with open SSL vulnerability. This is just to show you uh, the, what, what the, the issue is here. So this is the, the code that we use for that uh, page here. We have the form where we put in data. I want just to show you that uh, the word password there, that the value of password is not used anywhere. We just go to the server stays there in the memory. We don't do anything with it. Uh, and here I'm going to use Nmap. Nmap is a tool that can check the, the uh, environment, tells me if there are any servers uh, and if they are vulnerable to anything. And we found out that uh, this server is vulnerable to uh, heartbeat. And then uh, we can run a Python script that exploits the hard grid. And basically, it tells the server send it back that memory. OK, so now we can see the memory is quite empty because we didn't send anything to the server. And now we're going to send something to the server. We're going to fill out this form um, and send that, that data to the server. So this, in this case, it's a victim. It's one of the users that use that uh, open source server to connect with it and send it that data. Um, and then we submit. We, we can look at the post request. This is the cookie that was uh, returned by the server. We see that it returns some of the data. And then with the parameters that we sent, we can see that we also sent the password. So now um, the next move of the attacker, which is someone else here, is again to run the script um, that exploits heartbeat. And then we can see here that we actually get something in the memory. And this is exactly what we sent. If we look at it, this is now in the attacker's hands. Uh, get the cookie, all the, all the uh, data that we sent, and also the password. So that was uh, how hard it looks like. And what we saw here is that the server sends its secret to the client. But it gets worse than that. What can be worse than server sending its secret to the client? So, yeah. so immediately after this uh, disclosure of Heartbeat, in the community, people started to ask, well, this is a lot of memory that can be sent back from the server to the attacker. 64 kilobytes of memory, and you can send those requests again and again and again. Um, you can really exhaust the whole memory and download the whole uh, server's memory down. So there were discussions in the community whether it, is, it will be possible to download the private key of the server. And Cloudflare, a CDN company which we'll look at a bit later uh, as well, uh, decided to set up a server, NGNX server, again um, uh, in their cloud, and uh, it was vulnerable 
with, with this version that is vulnerable to a uh, hybrid and ask the community, go ahead, attack that server, let's see who gets there, if, if someone can get the private key. A few hours later, two guys downloaded the private key, and a few hours later, another two guys downloaded the private key. And um, uh, that was really a shocking thing, because private key is basically the fingerprint of the server, so now, uh, if I had the private key, I could maybe uh, spoof your bank server, right, and you send me all the information. Uh, we don't know anything. Uh, could be could be Google. Could be anything that was uh, spoofed out there. And this was for open for two and a half years. But it's still getting worse than that. So what can go can be worse than that? Remember that we had 70 or 80 percent of the servers of the internet exposed to that to that um, vulnerability. What is worse is that there's no audit. We don't know if, some, if someone, if something was exposed or exploited. We really don't know. We don't know if all our my Gmail uh, emails or, or, or my secrets, you know, or, or my bank account was compromised or not because Heartbeat, <coughs> since it was a side feature of, Heartbeat, of, uh, of OpenSSL, they decided not to have audit on it. So we actually don't know. And that was open for two and a half years. Many people now, after you know, um, all the latest findings, they, they think that maybe that could be also a, a, a backdoor that was paid by some um, country to, to make it happen. We don't know. So what we can learn from that? We can learn from that that uh, review is a responsibility. Review is very, very, very important. And it's, it's very good if you have your reviewers as your senior developers do the re re review for the other developers, for the more junior developers. It's, it's an opportunity for the senior developer to, to uh, uh, mentor uh, the junior developer, give them you know, guidelines, tell them about best practices, how to write code. And of course, they have to be very, very responsible by accepting the code. So if we look at the original code of Heartbeat, the one that was submitted, uh, we can see many, many issues there, like bad parameters then that don't tell anything about those parameters. We can see uh, hard-coded values. We can see use of uh, macros that it's very, very difficult to understand what those macros do. And uh, also, we also already well, we saw those misleading names that very, can be very confusing. So the reviewer had to go through all those issues, you know, all these hurdles and uh, it, it can uh, block the reviewer from actually seeing the right or the real vulnerabilities. The vulnerability, by the way, is the last line here the, at the bottom. So if you see some kind of a code that is written like that, it's better that you reject the code, train the developer how to write a good code, because then if you have a good code that you can actually read and understand, you get a better chance to, um, to see and to find those vulnerabilities. Don't forget to audit, audit everywhere. And it's even better to send the audit through syslog to all kinds of um, uh, alarm systems that can give you some kind of alarms. There were also, after Hardly, there were also many discussions about the security of open source because until Hardly, everyone believed that open source is more secure than closed source because, uh, let's say, when I'm writing a code in a closed source company, I'm writing my code, someone reviews it, and then we submit it, and that's it. Nobody ever sees that code again unless there's a fix to do or, or change. Uh, this is unlike in open source where you have uh, the code is open there, and everyone can review it as many times as they want. But we found other issues with open source that many, at, at that point of time, many open source uh, projects were not really go and, and, and um, follow any best practices of development. They didn't have the full SDLC like you uh, would see in, in big companies. Not all of them, but this is what was very common in open source projects, and today this is we, uh, most of, I, th I think, I, don't, I didn't count, but I know this is a very uh, known uh, issue and most of uh, the uh, open source projects that I know, uh, definitely the one I was 
uh, I joined, I, I was working on an open source of artificial intelligence uh, with, uh, that was also led by Microsoft and the University of Washington. Uh, we did the whole SDLC as, as you would do in any company, uh, this, you know, uh, static analysis, reviews, everything there. So, we're moving ahead in time, we get to this year, 2017. Uh, February 8th, and we get this tweet by Filippo, uh, Filippo Barcidora from Cloudflare. He tells us about ticket bid, ticket bid that is found at uh, F5 big IP uh, uh, appliances. So let's see what ticket bid is. Before I get to the ticket bid, I just want to give you a bit of a background. So, uh, Again, Omero before we mentioned the handshake of also of TLS. So um, TLS handshake, we which basically is there to create session keys that you can use to communication uh, with, the, with those session keys. And then once we ended that, um, the, there's another uh, way that the client can try to resume the session. So the client, we, we, we did a, like a pause, a stop in the, in the conversation. And then the client wants to reconnect to the server. We want to see whether we can use the same keys that we still have from the previous session, whether they are still valid. This is to uh, save the generating of uh, new keys, which is uh, um, very pricey in terms of performance. So you can see here that uh, the server holds like lots of uh, uh, session IDs and their keys, and the, and the client has its own key, and it sends the session ID to the server, asking me basically, can we continue and use that session? The, ser the server checks um, in his memory, find that session ID, and says, yes, we can use that session. Since I have it, I have the key already. At this point, the server changes its state. This is uh, the artificial intelligence way of thinking. We think on its states. So the server changes state. Now it's moving forward to another state. The state now it, has, it is in the session state already. Uh, we, sometimes we call it cipher state. And it tells the client, yes, uh, we can use that session. Uh, the way it tells the client that it is, is very important to understand, it just sends the same session, uh, session ID. If the server uh, doesn't want to continue with that session because it doesn't have the key anymore, because it's, the time passed, it's not valid anymore, it will send a new session ID. This is the way the server tells the client whether to use that session again or not. So in this case, we want to use the same session. Uh, so the server just returns the same session ID that it got from the client, which is the session ID that the server gave it before when they just created uh, the, the keys and, and did the whole handshake. So at this point, also the client uh, got the session ID. It compares, it compares the two session IDs, the one that he said, the one that he got. Uh, if they are the same, it also moves to the state of session, and uh, both can continue from now on top with the same keys that they had from the previous session. So now let's see how this protocol works with tickets. So tickets are there uh, to save on the server side. There are servers that connect with lots and lots of clients and servers, and they don't want to uh, spend their memory and resources of managing uh, sessions on their side. So in this case, what they do, at the end of the session, of, at the end of the handshake, just before they move to the state of session, they already have got the session key. The, when I'm, I'm talking about the full handshake. They just generated the session key. They encrypt it with uh, what we call stack, which is the session ticket uh, encryption key. It's a uh, special key for that and they send it to the client. So now the client has the session key encrypted on their side. They also have the session key uh, not encrypted that they can, they can use, and they have also the ticket. The server doesn't keep anything, stateless, completely stateless. So now that the, the server, the, uh, the client wants to resume that session, it has the, the ticket, it, it wants to send that ticket to the server. This is my key, I want to use it. Now we want to use the same protocol. 
if you remember the same, resume TLS protocol. The protocol told us uh, you have to set a session ID. If, it, if uh, the server accepts that session ID, it will return the same session ID. If not, it will return you a new session ID. So we, use, we don't use the same protocol. We don't want to create a new protocol. And, that's, and now we send a ticket. We don't have a session ID. So the, in this case, the, the client generates a session ID. This is generated by the client. Sends it to the server. The server gets that. Sorry. The server gets that session ID with the ticket. If the stack is still the same one that it can uh, that used before to encrypt that uh, ticket, it cannot decrypt the ticket. It has the key. Both sides have the keys, and they can continue uh, the session. If not, the session the, the server will just send a new session ID telling the the client. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the full TLS handshake. So now we can, we can look at what is ticket data. And starting with uh, giving you the, a bit of background on how it was found by uh, Filippo from uh, Cloudflow. So uh, the situation was like that, that they have like, uh, Cloudflow is a CDN, I mentioned before. It's a CDN, it's content delivery um, a network. Uh, what they do is they want to speed the delivery of content. Uh, they enable servers to get to and to reach to further servers in the globe. Uh, they use that by um, uh, caching the internet on their um, uh, data centers. They also uh, compress. So you can see here that on the server on the server side is uh, an agent. They call it Cloudflare called their, called their agent uh, Wellgun. Uh, that enables that connection between the server and um, the data center of, of Cloudflare. And the situation here is that we have also a five uh, big IP load balancer in the middle. So the connection of the TLS is between uh, the edge server of Cloudflare and a uh, five uh, load balancer. So we're going to concentrate the, over there. The, the problem is that the, uh, the customer, the Cloudflare customer, complained that something with the session connection doesn't work for them. And if you go look about uh, how the resume TLS uh, looks like, we see immediately that every time we do, we try to, to use the resume TLS, we get a fatal error. The communication is, uh, that doesn't work. There's a confusion in the protocol. The server is in one state, and the client is in another state, and we're going to see how it happened why they're both not on the same state. So we go back to the resume TLS with ticket. Here, the ticket is on Cloudflare side. It wants to send it to um, F5 load balancer to resume the session that they had before. It sends the ticket with, remember, a generated client ID. The server. Um, checks that and says, yes, OK, we can use that ticket. We can use that key. I managed to decrypt it. I have the key now. Let's use it. I'm sending you back the same session ID that you just sent me. Cloudflare checks that and says, no. You sent me uh, a different session ID. So I'm moving now my state to a full TLS entry. The server, we have to remember, is now already in a session state. They cannot communicate. The, the, the protocol is completely broken at this point. And this is the why we have this uh, fatal error. So let's see what, what happened there by looking carefully into the um, response of the session ID from the server. What, what did that server um, send back? So this is our G is well done. This is what Cloudflare sent, the, the, the session ID they sent. You can see here 16 bytes of session ID. This is uh, the session ID that uh, Cloudflare sent to uh, F5 LD. And this is the session ID that F5 returned. So Wagon sent 16 bytes, F5 returns 32 bytes. You can see that the first 16 bytes of F5 are exactly the same as the one they got. So they really want to go ahead and use that session. It's the same session ID, but they have now another uh, 16 bytes over there. What are these 16 bytes? And this is what made the confusion on the, on the client side, on the Cloudflare. It suddenly, it got something else than it sent. 
And this is why he, he, the, uh, uh, Claude Freud decided to move to uh, full TLS engine. So these are, these uh, 16 bytes are memory. So apparently F5 always returned 32 bytes of session ID, no matter what you send them. So the client, because this is a generated session ID by the client, it can even also uh, send them a, a session ID by one byte and get back 31 bytes of memory. So um, F5 is not completely wrong there. If you read the um, description of uh, the protocol, the, the protocol really um, suggests to use 32 bytes of session ID. But it's uh, better, of course, uh, if you get something from the client, it's really better that you also check it. You have to check what you get there. So um, these are the appliances that were exposed. It's all the big IP family of products of, uh, of F5. Of course, this is fixed. Lessons learned. Um, designer code review maybe could find this issue. Also, what I thought is maybe dynamic analysis and fuzzing, sending different uh, length of session ideas maybe could bring this up, this issue, before we release it to the customer. So moving ahead in time, about nine days later, same here, same month, just nine days later, now we get this uh, tweet by Tavis Amandi. Who knows Tavis Amandi? Very, very fa fa famous person. He's uh, one of the leaders of Project Zero. Project Zero is a um, project that is established by Google by uh, leading uh, security researchers. They want to make the internet more secure, and he finds all the time issues. He really finds all the time. If you, if you uh, connect with him on the, on the Twitter, it's a treasure. So we saw that tweet. Could someone from Cloud for Security Agency contact me? If this is the worst thing that you can get on the Twitter, <laughs> you really don't want it. It's a nightmare to get something like that. And this is how we came to know Cloud Bleed. So Cloud Bleed is uh, with availability in Cloudflare. We mentioned Cloudflare before three times already. This is the third time now. So it's really uh, funny. I'm not working for them. But. So again, CDN, um, on top of uh, making connection much faster and uh, performance-wise, they also give a lot of security um, help to their clients, and uh, so it's also a security um, services. And, and Tavi says, look, Cloudflare has been leaking customer HTTP sessions for months from Uber, one password, Fitbit, okay, Cupid. You, you really uh, put it on the internet, he marked it, but uh, there were some messages from OkCupid of people, you know, full messages. This is how a uh, page looks like. Usually you won't see that, but in this case, you can actually see the linked memory on the page. Usually the page doesn't have something to show it, but it's always there. Uh, you get with a response from the, from the server. So a lot, a lot of memory coming from Cloudflare, leaking, leaking from Cloudflare. Now, this is a closed source, I don't have the source, but I managed to do some pseudo coding uh, after you know, reading a lot of uh, blogs by people from Cloudflare and by um, Tavis Omandi, so I managed, I think, to understand what happened there. And this is what I'm going to show you now. So Cloudflare, they used a, a, a 10 minutes? Thanks. So Cloudflare used um, a third party library that library is uh, uh, used for many things. Here, we, what you can see is to check whether we are at the end of page. At the end, it's checking at the end of, of buffer, but you use it to check whether we are at the end of page. Here, uh, what we, um, the P um, uh, is our current character, and PE is the character at the end of the file. Okay, so we can here we can increment P step by step until we check whether we are uh, at the end of file, whether we are at PE. Okay, we want to know of that and then we go to some kind of end of file smart handling. So anyone sees an issue here? What do you 
the seat? So, so that is not the issue. P, P is uh, like a, it's, it's a, like a pointer, and P is we we'll see all, all, almost uh, we we'll see uh, immediately that we know of them. The problem here is the equal sign. So this is basically we check buffer, okay, the end of buffer. You don't want to use equal sign because um, if in the code we manage for somehow to uh, pass P E because we incremented P a bit further, we will never be equal to P anymore, right? So we will just continue, we'll never be again equal to PE, and therefore this is a classic way to create a buffer overflow, or a buffer overrun, depends if you read it right. The better way to do it is this way, okay? Uh, bigger or equal, so even if I pass the end of the buffer, I know to stop over there, and not to continue. <coughs> So let's look quickly on, the, on this pseudo code here. Um, this is a, um, a parcel that Cloudflare wrote, and they use that library that we just saw. So the parcel basically goes on the HTML, tries to understand what uh, um, tags they have, and do some kind of smart things with them. So we have one tag that ends uh, with the right end of tag sign and also at the end of file. This is a very extreme situation. This is what also Cloudflare said. Look, this is a very extreme situation. It's an it's a end of tag, end of file, and only, only if the end of tag is, is wrong. There's an error there. Okay, so this is, we're going to look at how it happened. So um, let's run the script here. Then let's run the, the code here. It goes on this tab, okay? And then it checks whether uh, am I on the end of, of uh, did I find the uh, end of tag sign. Yes, I found it. Let's do some, something very smart with this tag now. And also, I want to check whether I'm at the end of the file. So now, before I'm going to check whether I'm at the end of the file, I'm moving that pointer one step backward. Why do I do that? Because we saw before that the library that we use to check whether we are at the end of the file is actually incrementing it one step further, right? So we want to stay on the same place to check whether we are at the end of the file. Of the file. That's why we moved it one step backwards, and now it's, it's moved it one step forward. We are at the same place. We are at, uh, equal to P. We are at, uh, the, at the end of the page, and uh, do something else with it. They basically stop reading. Now let's look at a situation where it end, the tag ends in a wrong way. So we got to the wrong sign. There's an uh, error handling over there. Look what we forgot. We forgot to uh, move the pointer one step backward. <coughs> and now we also have this uh, incrementing of the pointer even further. We already passed the end of file. You can see that? We already passed the end of file. We'll never be again at the end of file. We're already after it. So we're just reading and we'll continue and read the content and we just send it away to the client. So in this case, because it's Cloudflare, it's multi-tenant, lots of uh, um, uh, different clients, different people connected, they just send information of other people to that, to that client. And that's all from, of course, from memory. And you can see that we had two issues here. Uh, we had to have each one of them is, you can say, maybe it's slow, but together they created some very uh, critical impact. Uh, one of them, fi if we could uh, fix one of them, or if we had only one of them, we wouldn't have that issue that we just saw. It's the, the, the combination of both issues. It's really work condition to have something like that. That's a uh, code review again, all the time. Code review is very, very important. Unit testing. Unit testing we use to test extreme cases. Maybe the, this is an extreme case that could be found using unit testing. So, five minutes to end. We have uh, we are in the summary. So we wanted to to make a connection between a client and a server. Here we see it's an open connection. Um, everything can happen there. I can put uh, man in the middle and you know, tamper with the, with the data, read the data, even stop the data, whatever I want to do there. And therefore, we, uh, we want to have the CIA trial, right? Confidentiality, integrity, and um, availability. 
We want to implement that on our connection over there. Currently, we don't have anything of that. We, there's no any security in this situation. And in order to have security, we use TLS connection. We use firewall, a five firewall. And we use um, even uh, cloud security services. Now we have the full uh, CI trial. But what happens if those are um, vulnerable? Basically, we are now completely vulnerable again. So the conclusion is that security products, like any other product, they in increase the attack surface. And uh, therefore, they can expose us to, uh, to very bad things as we saw down. And we always have to follow those standards and best practices, like in the whole industry of design, code of view, audit logs, clear secrets for memory, test and test and test, unit test, static, dynamic, penetration test, everything you know. All that should be there. Thank you. Yeah, we have uh, two minutes for questions. Ticket bleed. Everything was clear. <laughs> sorry? Oh, sorry, Nancy. So, partly sort of little fire under OPS itself. You know, the port to the Libra SSL, the Libra SSL started cleaning up their act. Uh, how well have they done? OPS SSL? So, of course, they fix that. Open SSL is, uh, okay, so this, this was a very interesting uh, thing because uh, after a bit, people understood that Open SSL is really the infrastructure, one of the infrastructure of the internet, and they created uh, a, a group of, um, I don't remember the name, I actually had it somewhere here, uh, that is sponsored by many, many companies to be able um, to create um, a bug bounty on those infrastructure open source of the internet because it's open source, you couldn't do anything like it, a bug bounty. And today if you find an issue with the open source, there's a consortium of companies that can, um, that can give you something. So this is something that's changed to understand, we understand now the importance of open source and, and those kind of infrastructure things in the internet. And we also want to, uh, to uh, work with the community in order to uh, make them better. As you guys are leaving, we're going to have a short uh, coffee and pastry break here outside and down in the garden and, and so on. For 15 minutes, we're shortening the short.